text when I preach on it. But, um, whoops.
Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We just say thank you for all things that you have done for us. We especially thank you for this weekend as you brought us together last night with all the local EFC churches to praise your name, to sing songs of praise to you. That through you, that we were able to have this great time of worship with your people, with your children. And so we pray that you continue to give us and, and you work within our hearts so that we live this life of worship towards you. Not just one night, but every day of our lives. And Father, as you are working in our hearts, we also remember those in this world who, who still need you. Father, may, uh, may we not forget those in Turkey, in Syria, in Ukraine, in Russia. And may we continue to trust in you as you work in those countries. Whether it is relief, aid, whether it is restoration, we trust in your plan and in your ways. And Father, here in this church, we continue to lift up our situation to you with the ongoing pastoral and director searches. We don't know what you have in store for us, but we continue, continue to humble our hearts before you and come before you and say that you are the one who is the head of this church. So this morning, may you continue to guide us May we continue to worship you. May, may we continue to hear your word and meditate upon it. In your name, amen. All right, let's stand as we sing songs of praise. Declare your promise, 
my soul now to stand. So what can I say? But what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, complete with you. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. So I'll stand with on high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand. My soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. So what can I say? And what can I do? Over this heart, oh God. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're placing that I never So undeniable, I, 
I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love, love, love your good, good father. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Stars in their place, Lord, it was your voice. Come in some mornings, even oceans and their waves about at your feet. your glory I am your beloved, 
your creation and you love me as I am you have called me chosen for your kingdom on a shame to call me your own I am your beloved your creation and you love me as I am you have called me chosen for your kingdom on a shame to call me your own I am your beloved I am your beloved Yes, Father, we are your beloved, your chosen, those who have been called into your kingdom. Father, we, we are so thankful to have you as our good, good father. And so may we continue to turn our direction and our attention towards you, to set our eyes upon you, and to see you for who you are. We thank you, and we lift your name on high. In your name, amen. All right, please be seated. Welcome to OC. We're going through several announcements today. Uh, we, we, we do invite you to continue to pray and intercede for uh, those in Turkey and Syria. Again, as you all know, they have been devastated by earthquake uh, several weeks ago and so uh, they are still um, rebuilding and restructuring and so if you uh, if God stirs in your heart uh, we do ask that you uh, donate to uh, the uh, organiz uh, fundraising organization that EFC Foundation has uh, set up and so uh, if you do want to donate make your check to EFC F and with the memo Turkey slash Syria earthquake relief fund the online donation is uh, the end of this month on the 31st. And uh, again, do not use Zell for this. Uh, please uh, send uh, using checks. Uh, secondly, next month in April, April 22nd, we have our annual, uh, well, I guess it used to be annual. Uh, now we're actually starting to bring it back uh, after COVID. But uh, yeah, we have our spring picnic at Irvine Regional Park again on the 22nd. It will be a potluck style, so we invite you to uh, bring some of the dishes, del delicious f dishes that you guys have prepared. And also this is a great opportunity to invite your friends to, uh, so that we can come to know them. And uh, yeah, there'll be fun, uh, food fun and lots of games. So yeah, mark your calendars for April 22nd for the uh, church picnic at Irvine Regional Park. With that being said, we have our scripture reading today. It is Matthew 6. 9 to 13 it says this pray then like this our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also for have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil today we have a special guest speaker, Pastor Frank. You all have uh, seen him many times here before, but we are delighted to have him uh, speaking for us today. The sermon titled, Our Father. Let's give Pastor Frank a warm OC welcome. So I guess the mic's on. Yeah, good. Well, it's always a pleasure for me to come here and, and share the word with you. Very happy to see my dear friends, Eric and Liz Huang, here today. Um, the Huang family and the Makia family go way back and are very close. I really appreciate the songs. 
um, that were shared. I thought they were, they set the tone very nicely for the message. Um, there's a lot more that goes into a service than a sermon. And I couldn't imagine uh, trying to sing and play an instrument at the same time. That for me is unimaginably difficult and complex. I would rather preach 10 sermons than sing one, than lead one song service. So that is an amazing talent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the text myself as well. Um, repetition is always good. I'm doing it from Matthew. Am I still on? Yeah. Okay, good. Matthew chapter 6. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today, this day, our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, we commit this prayer into your hands. Though spoken so long ago, we pray, God, that you will speak it to our hearts. Morning, day, in a way that is life transforming. And we will be your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the most commonly prayed prayer in Christendom today. Everybody prays it. Everybody knows it well. It's a very familiar prayer. And like all things that are familiar, we can sometimes speak the words and do it routinely without probing closely what they mean. We just say them. We see the Lord's Prayer as something that the church is to pray, and when we pray our Father, we do so as a company of believers. The Our Father is our prayer. It's a prayer that we share together. It is a prayer that belongs to us, that we routinely say. And we fail to realize that this prayer was his prayer. I'm referring to Jesus Christ. We fail to realize that this prayer was his prayer before it was ours. That he handed it down to us. And that he opens it up to us. And that he invites us to come alongside him and pray it in him and with him. The Our Father starts with Him. If you really want to understand the deep meaning of the Our Father, you must start with Him. Whoops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not too competent with this thing. So in the Gospel of Matthew, you, start, you go with the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, but you've got to go back to chapter 3 to get the context for it. Jesus' baptism, when he comes up out of the water in dedication to the Father's cause in the world, being baptized by John the Baptist, that was his first public declaration of his commitment to his own mission as the Son of the Father. And as he comes up out of the water in dedication to the Father's mission in the world, the heavens open and the Father speaks. Matthew chapter 3 tells us what the Father says. As soon as Jesus out of the water, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus is the favored Son of the Father with whom the Father is pleased. 
He came down from heaven, from the Father, from his eternal relationship with the Father. He came from heaven, from his eternal, intimate communion with the Father as the favored Son of the Father for all time. He came down from that relationship in order to open up that relationship to us. We are not by nature favored sons and daughters of the Father. Only He is by nature from all eternity the favored Son of the Father. And He comes down from heaven to open up that relationship to us and to give us the capacity in Him to pray our Father. Our Father is a gift that He comes down to share with us. In fact, the story of humanity is a story of wayward sons and daughters who have sinned and alienated themselves from the Father's love and from the Father's cause for creation. I'm reminded of Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 to 2. Where God, speaking of Israel, says, Out of Egypt, out of Egypt, I have called my son, referring to Israel. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. But the more I called out to them, the further away from me they went. Like the prodigal son who left the household of the father and went out into the far country and squandered his inheritance and denied the love of the Father, and denied the Father's cause in the world, defining themselves as autonomous in no need of the Father's love or of the household of the Father for their own identity or their own purpose in life. This is the story of humanity. It's not just the story of Israel. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us to our own way, as it says in Isaiah 53. The Our Father is not our prayer by nature. It is a prayer that we as sinful humanity have denied. It is a prayer that we as sinful humanity have parted from, have refused to speak with our lips or with our hearts. We all, like the wayward prodigal son in the, sto in the parable of Luke chapter 15, have gone into the far country and preferred to live as orphans rather than as children of the Heavenly Father. The Our Father is something we have fundamentally denied. Jesus Christ comes down from heaven as the favored Son of the Father to restore unto us the privilege of saying these simple words our Father. And He came to open up this privilege to us at a great cost. He entered into flesh. He left the portals of glory and entered into lowly flesh, bearing the pain and trials of the human race, going all the way to the cross to descend down into the depths of our shame and our alienation, and our suffering, and our condemnation. He enters down into that. He goes to the far country. On the cross, he goes down into the far country of our alienation from God. Unlike the elder son in the parable, who scorned the younger son and resented the compassion that the father showed towards him. Jesus was the faithful elder son. He went out into the far country to find us and to take us back to the household of the father. He suffered a great cost to give us the capacity to pray our father. I'm fond of saying that the entire gospel is found in these two words. Our Father. Never pray it as a mere routine. 
Never let these words come from your lips as though they don't mean something. Every time we start that prayer with our Father, a sense of gratitude should well up from deep within, recognizing the great cost that he paid to give us these simple words and to allow us to pray it. There are times when I face great difficulty in life and I lack the words. I don't know how to pray as I ought, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. I groan from deep within. But our Father is something I can say. It's the most instinctive form of prayer. It's where prayer begins. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 16, that the moment we are born again, the spirit of adoption, we are adopted as sons and daughters <laughs> in, into this relationship with the Heavenly Father through Jesus. He's the son by nature. We're sons and daughters by adoption. The spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship, comes from Jesus Christ into our hearts and awakens us not only to Christ as Lord, but to his Father as our Father. And that is the most instinctive form of prayer. It's where prayer begins. From the moment we are born again, the soul cries out, Abba, which is Aramaic for Father. An intimate address. Not quite as informal as Daddy. I think that goes too far. After all, the Lord's Prayer starts with our Father in heaven, transcendent, above all, Lord of all. There's a reverence there that Daddy, I think, doesn't quite capture. But nevertheless, it's an intimate address. It's a very intimate way of saying Father. Close to Daddy, yeah. But I don't know. I don't like that, the use of that term. It lacks reverence. But Father in an intimate way. That's the first impulse of the soul. It's the first thing we instinctively say to God the moment we are born again. The soul awakens to God as the Heavenly Father. It's where all prayer has its root. It's where all prayer springs forth. This new relationship with God that Jesus Christ, paying a dear price, opens up for us, makes the Our Father as instinctive to the soul as natural breath is to the body. It's the one thing I can say most easily, most instinctively, most naturally as a born-again Christian. We can say, our Father. What a wonderful, wonderful two words. And Jesus modeled for us how to relate to the Heavenly Father in prayer. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 puts it this way concerning Jesus Christ. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus never failed to be pleasing to his Father. And he, in his entire life, he takes on the calling that the Father laid forth for him. He takes that on in reverent submission. Jesus continuously with his entire life said, My Father, my Father, my Father, in all things, my Father. I am here to accomplish His will, to fulfill the cause of His love in the world. And with reverent 
and I repeat, reverent submission. He related continuously to his heavenly Father, laying out for us how we are to relate to the Father in and through him. The Our Father is intimate, yes, but it's also reverent. And in the All in the Our Father, we are laying down our own idolatry, our own self-centered approach to life. And we are joining Jesus in fulfilling the cause of the Father's love in the world. The Our Father is a form not only of praise and thanksgiving, but of submission, reverent submission. Recognizing that he is Lord. I lay my own lordship down. I lay down my right to govern my own life the way I want to do it. I lay down my own self-centered, narcissistic, self-preoccupied approach to life. I lay that down in the Our Father. I lay it down. And I join Jesus in reverent submission to the cause of the Father's love in the world. With this great gift comes an awesome responsibility. The Our Father lays a path out before me, before us as a church that is defined by Jesus' life and mission. But notice what it says about the Father, the great Abba, you know, the, the term that Jesus used for Father, the Abba, the, the intimate relationship, and yet the reverent submission to lordship. You see this about God in the original creation account. You have in chapter 1, God, with the word of his mouth, calling forth the cosmos into existence. The starry hosts, the planets, the earth and all of its array, by the mere word, such vast power, such unimaginable sovereignty and lordship. That's chapter one of Genesis. But then when you get to chapter two, this same God condescends, stoops low, gathers the dust, and breathes into the nostrils of Adam, willing and opening up the possibility of communion. The sovereign, all-powerful, and transcendent creator stoops low to relate personally and intimately with humanity. And you get that beautiful bringing together of both the intimacy and the reverence that goes into the Our Father. This is who God is. This is what the Our Father calls us to. The Our Father. Reverent submission. And so in the Our Father, I not only celebrate with great gratitude this new relationship that Jesus opens up to us, calls us to share in, paid such a dear price to give us the privilege of praying, but all, as I said, with that comes a heavy weight of responsibility, a new loyalty, a new set of priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all of our needs will be taken care of. This is what Jesus teaches later on in Matthew 6. And the Lord's Prayer follows that priority. The Lord's Prayer is not self-preoccupied. Did you know that your prayer life can be immature because it's self-centered? 
If all you ever pray about are your own personal needs, what set of priorities does that reflect? Our prayer lives are to be modeled after Jesus and are to take on the maturity that Jesus himself had when he prayed. The Lord's Prayer guides us in that. If at the Our Father I am laying down my own idols, laying down my own sense of command over my own life, and reverently submitting to the Father and to the cause of his love in the world, then that cause must take priority in my prayer life. And notice how the Lord's Prayer puts that first. It doesn't start with, give us our daily bread. Give us our personal, fulfill our personal needs. That's not where the Lord's Prayer starts. Seek first the kingdom, Jesus said. And our prayer life is to reflect that priority. So notice where the Lord's Prayer begins. Hallowed. Be your name. In other words, may your name be recognized, set apart as holy and sacred on the earth. May everyone on the earth honor that name. Lord Adonai. That's how Israel came to call God. Adonai. Lord Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Adonai in Hebrew, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the great Shema of Israel. When I studied Hebrew, we had to memorize that verse. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Shema Yitzrael, Adonai Aliheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Therefore, there is to be no division of loyalty. All loyalty goes exclusively to him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. May your name Adonai, Lord, be set apart on the earth as sacred and honored and revered all over the world. That's not the case now. Just turn on the news and it's pretty obvious that's not the case. We live in a violent world filled with hate and idolatry. The world is filled with idols, power, money, might, and strength. When will the world revere his name above all else? It starts here. When we pray this prayer, hallowed be your name in the world. It starts with us. The churches are little colonies of believers who begin to do what they pray will one day be done throughout all the earth. It starts with us. We already begin to call it a reality that doesn't yet exist throughout the world, but we're going to speak it forth. We're going to make it real among us. And we will pray and labor for that day when it will be done in the earth, throughout the earth. When his name as Lord will be honored and revered everywhere. And then humanity will know the peace and the freedom that God always intended through his son. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. I'm reminded of Revelation chapter 21 where it says the heavenly city comes down from heaven to earth. And there's a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And God's will is done on the earth as it is done in heaven. But that day is not yet. But we pray for it now. We work for it now. We become agents 
of the kingdom of God in our world. The reign of God, the liberating reign of God. The kingdom of God is not tyrannical. It's not oppressive. It's liberating. When we call forth the reign or the kingdom of God on earth, God's rule, we are calling forth something that overthrows the dark powers and liberates humanity to become everything God created them to become in service to his cause of love in the world. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. In my liberating acts, overthrowing the dark powers and freeing you to recognize God's lordship and to find your freedom in that recognition, that's what the kingdom of God does. Through Christ and in the Spirit of God, His rule comes upon you. It's not a place, it's more like a force field. And you are able, caught up in that kingdom, to live for it, to put it first, to find in that priority the only freedom you'll ever know. Notice how the Lord's Prayer begins. Your name, your kingdom, your will. You, God, you, God, you, God. May your name be hallowed on the earth. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. In the Our Father, the first impulse is reverent submission to God's priorities and to God's cause of love in the world. That's the first priority of prayer. I never want to pray without including something about that. <laughs> now I know it. sometimes we go to prayer with great need, with an urgent situation, and so we start with that, and I understand that. But I never want to close that prayer without, without saying, God, may your name be glorified. May your cause of love be accomplished through us and in this situation. May your will be done on the earth. Every prayer needs to put its weight on that priority. Your name, your kingdom, your will. Reverent submission. The Our Father starts with great gratitude for this wonderful privilege. But it also extends to an awesome responsibility. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. How we pray is how we live. We pray this way because we wish to live this way. So it's not the Lord's Prayer is not just a pattern for prayer, it's a pattern for life. Are we living our lives in a way that prioritizes God's cause of love? That puts that first? Or are we just chasing after materialistic dreams? Are we all caught up with the materialistic goal of being successful? I always like to tell people, success is overrated. Jesus doesn't say to his disciples, be successful. <laughs> he says to them, be great. And how are you great, according to Jesus? The one who is servant of all is the greatest of all. I always like to tell young people, hone your skills. Be the best that you can be in order to serve more effectively. Don't settle for success. You're better than that. Go for greatness. And in your life of service, you will discover greatness.
the greatness of God's love. That's something worth living for. Never sell out to the materialistic dreams of your culture. You're better than that. In Christ, you're better than that. I've never heard anybody brag about the size of someone's bank account at their funeral. They always try to talk about ways in which this person showed love. It's almost like even people of the world seem to intuit this, that real greatness isn't found in material acquisition, that real greatness is found in love, in giving oneself over to something greater than oneself. Your name, your kingdom, your will, God in reverent submission, Father, our Father, in reverent submission, I will give myself over to the cause of your love in the world as my top priority. And in that, I will discover the greatness for which I was created. Success is overrated. Go for greatness. But then the prayer changes because the question I often get when I'm teaching on the Lord's Prayer is, what, don't my needs matter? <laughs> yes, they do. What does it say in the Bible? Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. God is concerned with our needs. And so the Lord's Prayer shifts from your, your, your to our, our, our. Our bread, our debts our trials. First, his concerns, then our concerns. But notice how his concerns come first. <laughs> and within that, <laughs> within that project of the Father's love for the world, now here are my concerns. Within my submission to the Father and to his, the cause of his love in the world, I've got concerns. <laughs> Give us today our daily bread. Now this daily bread was a symbol. It meant more than just a loaf of bread. Now, I love a good, freshly baked loaf of bread. My wife will tell you she loves it even more than I do, I think. Can't beat that. But it, it's more than a loaf of bread. It was symbolic of all that sustains us materially. Now, Jesus says we don't seek after bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that has the priority. But the bread is still necessary for life. And so our daily bread could include more expansively our income. All that sustains us materially. Sustain us, Lord. Give us our daily bread that we need to sustain ourselves as bodies, as embodied beings in this world. Now, our daily bread, how we partake of that, again, is governed, first and foremost, by his kingdom, which is our top priority. And so, when I pray for daily bread, I've got in the back of my mind that I meant not to engage in gluttony and hoarding. <laughs> this is not what the daily bread is for. This is not what God provides it for. We are to have generous hands. And if you want to look at your kingdom priorities, check out your checkbook. Where's your money going? It's a sobering thought to do that now and again. 
I'm going to look over the last three months. Where has our money been going? <laughs> Are there kingdom priorities here? And there are times when I'll say to my wife, uh, we need to uh, give a little more, or she'll say it to me. There are people with far greater needs than I have. And God provides the daily bread as something to be shared. Because I don't only have our sustenance in mind, but also being an agent in the sustenance of others. Give us today, this day, our daily bread. Notice the focus on the now. Jesus teaches later in Matthew 6, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't be consumed with worry about the future. Now, I have a bank account. <laughs> I have an investment portfolio. <laughs> but I don't put my trust in that. Jesus said thieves can break in and steal. The stock market can go down. That's the modern version of that. I don't even want to look at my quarterly statements anymore. <laughs> They're too depressing. <laughs> I see that money just going, going, going. Well, I don't trust in that anyway. God will always take care of our needs, and we need to stay generous. We need to trust in him. Trust in him enough to be generous without worry. Our daily bread, this day, now, And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Notice the past tense there. Reverent submission means that we don't hoard the grace of God. We share it. When we ask for forgiveness, we make it clear to the Lord, all the grace you've given us so far, we've shared it. We've been as gracious and as forgiving towards others as you have been to us. And we come before you now for more grace, letting you know, Lord, <laughs> as if he didn't know already, <laughs> that we've been loving caretakers of that grace that you've laid in our hands and given to us. And we have shared. All along the way, Lord, we've shared it. Forgive us now as we have been forgiving others. No hoarding in the kingdom of God, in that reverent submission to God as Father. No hoarding materially or spiritually. Everything in reverent submission that the Father lays in our hands, we share. We give. If someone asks me for forgiveness, they will find me an easy touch. I am always ready and willing to forgive. Because I know how in constant need I am for the same. Not only from God, but from others. We all have feet of clay. Forgive us our debts as we also have been forgiving of others. Now this one is often difficult for people to understand. Lead us not into temptation. The word for temptation here means more than just evil tempting us. It, it, it means trial, testing. Trials, I guess you could say. Trials of the evil one oppressing us or trying to lure us, 
trials that we find ourselves involved in. This leading us not into trials, actually the original context and language used here has the sense of don't bring us there and abandon us there. <laughs> now, of course, we know God won't do that. But rather deliver us from the evil one. All along the way, be our father. Protect us from the snares of the devil. Be with us in our trials so that in the midst of those I might in reverent submission to you go through these in a way that is honoring of your name. Accompany us in our trials. And we know that God has already done that in the figure of his son. Jesus, the son of the father, who is one in essence with the father, came into flesh to bear our trials to be with us, to unite himself to us in our trials, to bear up under those trials and to overcome them on our behalf so that we in him could be free. So God has already proven that he is with us in our trials and that he bears up under them, that he accompanies us and that he provides us with what we need to be victorious. And so the Lord's Prayer is, is merely affirming what we know already to be true. Be with us in our trials. Deliver us from the evil one. Just as you did in your Son, you do now in your Spirit. As we conform in the image of your Son, in reverent submission to you, Father, as our Father. And I always like to tell my students, even when we fail in these trials, there is something to be learned. I always tell my students, don't waste your failures. Examine them. Find out why you were vulnerable the way you were. What is it? about me <laughs> that allows me to have this vulnerability. Reflect on your failure and let God give you wisdom for how you can be better prepared the next time around. Even our failures can be stepping stones in the direction of overcoming. Don't just say, Jesus, forgive me, amen, and move on. <laughs> well, the slate has been wiped clean. That's all I care about. No, that shouldn't be all you care about. <laughs> you should care about improving. <laughs> so it behooves us sometimes to look at those failures more closely and in prayer to ask God to give us wisdom and how we could be better prepared the next time around. And have this attitude, the next time I get into this situation, I'm going to be much better prepared. The devil's not going to catch me off guard this next time. I'll be ready. Deliver us from the evil one. The Our Father casts its light over the entire Lord's Prayer. Because in every single line, we are following Jesus in his reverent submission to the Father. With every line, the gospel is spoken to us. This is a relationship that I have offered you and given you freely, though you don't deserve it. This is a prayer I open up to you, even though you've gone into the far country and denied your inheritance and denied the love of the Father, I have come and taken you home and given you this prayer. With gratitude and praise, we pray it. We never let the Our Father come forth from our mouths without that gratitude. And yet, also, 
we commit ourselves line after line after line to the reverent submission to the Father that Jesus showed. In all that we pray, the Our Father is always there in the back of our minds. And how we pray is how we live. Let us pray. Lord, we commit ourselves afresh and anew to the Our Father and all that it implies, not only for our prayer life, but for our lives. What a wonderful gift this prayer is, a gift that costs much for you to share with us. And we don't, we don't shy away from the responsibility by your grace to live, to pray and to live the Our Father and all that it implies. Lord, we pray, God, that you will give us the courage, the courage of commitment today to align our prayer life and our lives with the Our Father, to receive it gratefully, and to live it passionately. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand? How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all men that he should give his only son to make a righteous treasure how great a pain of searing loss the father turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring it the sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Called out upon the scoffers it was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in any no gift, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? His death is an answer But this I know with all my heart his wounds had paid my ransom How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a righteous treasure how great the pain of searing loss The Father turned His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many 
the sun's too cold and rain. Now may the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all until we meet again. Amen. Let's thank Pastor, uh, Pastor Frank for that wonderful message. We have refreshments in the back and also live groups. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week. God bless.